I, I want to see, I want to learn, I want to see different things. So if I keep doing exactly the same thing again and again, the same routine, then I will become my routine and I will never grow. Welcome to the Funny and Failure podcast, a podcast that celebrates failure and shines the light on the emotional side of comedy with yours truly, Michael Kahan. Today's guest is a special human and boy, that's an understatement. I don't quite have the words to explain how much I enjoyed this chat, especially around Naveed's brilliant and forward moving mindset. It's a real treat to hear from this man and I honestly could have spoken to him for days on end. I won't give too much away, but this chat is crazy in how each time a hurdle appears, for example, war, living in a refugee camp, near-death experience, immigrating and learning a new language multiple times, Navid is able to navigate these so-called challenges without expectations and go through it with an eager, positive, puppy-like dog mindset added with a strong desire to grow and learn. Also, just some housekeeping before we get into it. Videos are now available on YouTube under Michael Kahan. That's Kahan with a K, unless you're listening to this already. I find it adds a new element and dynamic to these chats, so check it out. And as per usual, I'll still be posting snippets of the chat on my Instagram page under Funny and Failure. So check it out if you want to keep up to date with the latest news and information regarding the podcast. I'd also love it if you would share the podcast or share your takeaways from the chat. It really motivates me, helps the podcast grow, and ensures I can lock in amazing guests like this one. And just as a reminder, the podcasts come out every Monday at 5 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any other terrific episodes. Anyway, let's get into it. Let's introduce today's guest. Naveed Negaban is an award-winning actor and producer Known for his roles as the Shadow King or Farouk in Legion, Abu Nazir in Homeland, the Sultan in Aladdin, General Dostam in Twelve Strong, plus he's been in Charlie Wilson's War, Curb Your Enthusiasm, American Sniper, American Assassin, Damascus Cover, Baba June, Law and Order, Veep, CSI, The Closer, The West Wing, The Cleaning Lady, The Mentalist, Arrow, 24, Without a Trace, Jag, to name a few. So as you can imagine, we dive deep and we cover a lot in this chat, such as lack of expectations, fear, living in a refugee camp, legion, living your day as if it's your last, teachers and mentors being kicked out of acting school, playing villains, creating a scene at a funeral, and making the world a better place. So this is a very true story of resilience and empowerment, You'll leave this chat feeling inspired and motivated, knowing that you can do anything. Sit back, enjoy. I know you'll love it. Actually, I think we should start with a quote of yours. I'm going to read you this quote. Okay. The best break I got was me being thrown out of theater company, out of the theater company at school. I'd love to know what happened there and what you meant by that quote. (laughs) Um, Well, I was going to call... um, I was working as an actor in Germany and then I moved to the U S and I couldn't speak English. And also I wanted to familiarize myself with the American acting style because in Germany it was a little bit technical, especially what I learned. It was very, it was like a boot camp. And uh, uh, I was going to college. I was the oldest kid in the school and um, uh, we had finals. I, I had a couple of discussion with a professor that I was saying, okay, this is how I see it. Um, and this, this is what I want to do. And I never forget. I was going to, I was trying to play Stanley and streetcar named desires. And I was just saying that I want to just do a scene of it. And, um, uh, was telling me, what? There's no way that you're going to be able to do that. No, you cannot touch it. I did it for my finals and I got a C out of it. But um, there, it was a scene, two of, the, uh, two of the kids, they were rehearsing the scene and the philosophy of the professor was that uh, 
uh, you have to plan every step during the scene. So there are, um, there are objectives and then it's a super objective. So you have to meet and manipulate in order to get your objective, to achieve your objective. And then from there, you go to the next step, to the next step, and ultimately you have your super objective. And uh, I went to the school and these kids, they were rehearsing and they came up to me and they said, Navid, we cannot get this scene. It doesn't work, it's not working. I said, well, why don't you try it this way? This morning when you woke up to come to the school, did you know that you're going to be having a conversation with me? He said, no. I said, did you know that you're going to be talking to me about the scene? He said, no. I said, okay. The only thing that you knew was that you're going to the school to go to the theater class. He said, yes. I said, okay. So your scene, your super objective is what you know about the scene. And what you know about the scene is the first three lines of the scene. So why don't you improvise, go a few steps back, improvise a couple lines, and because you know how the scene starts, that will be your super objective. And then from there, be free and let it go. And yeah, wherever nice. you end up, that's where you're supposed to be. So they did their finals and then the professor <clears throat> stood up, started applauding for them, and then I'm sitting next to him. <laughs> and he said, okay, now explain, how did you get that? And the moment that he said, I just put my hands on my head, I said, oh shit, oh shit. And a friend of mine, Lorenzo, he always, he still tells me that he's the reason that I got kicked out of school. Lorenzo said, well, we were trying your way. It didn't work out. And then we talked to Navid and Navid told us that the super objective is not at the end of the scene, it's at the beginning of the scene. So that's how we did it. And that's how, how we ended up here. So the, after the finals, he started, he was applauding and just kind of looking at me sideways. And after we were done, he took me outside. He put his arms around my shoulder and said, leave my theater and never come back. And if you ever become famous, I don't want to hear about it. Whoa. So that's brutal. That was it. The, that was the best gift that he could have given me. So I, I left. And uh, I ended up doing Boundaries, uh, which was a short film, a 20 minute short film. I'm playing a mute trombonist. That film um, got me a nomination for Best Actor at one of the festivals. And that was my very first film I was doing here in the US. Okay. And then uh, the film went to Slam Dance, won the grand jury at Slam Dance, came to Egyptian Theater in Los Angeles, and kind of a, just the ball started rolling after that. But um, the thing is that um, years later, uh, if I'm talking too much, tell me that I'm talking too much. No, no, no. Oh, years okay. later, after I did Homeland, I got a message. And the message was sent to me by a friend of mine that the professor send me a note. I truly enjoy your work and keep up the good work. And um, I watch your homeland and your work is magnificent. Oh, wow. And um, I couldn't, I was trying to call him. I didn't, I, I delayed it for six months. And um, then I called my friend and I said, okay, uh, can you give me his email address? I, will write, uh, I would like to write to him. So Navid, he passed away. I said, what are you talking about? So yeah, he passed away. And his service is down the road. I went to the, I went to the theater. I saw all the old friends. Everybody was sitting there and everybody was there. And um, everybody was getting up to, to speak. And they asked me if I want to say something. I said, sure, I will say something at the oh, end. That's big of you. Yeah. And uh, all the students, they stood up. One was saying, oh, my car broke down. He will let me use his car. The other one is getting up. Oh, 
I didn't have money to pay for my room, uh, for my apartment. He let me stay in his, in his house. The other one said that uh, uh, I didn't have enough food. He would cook at home and bring me food. He would loan me money. Jeez. And I, I was sitting there. I went up there and I said, I'm so sorry, guys. But I have no idea. Excuse my language. Who the fuck you're talking about? <laughs> because I really, I, this man, uh, he was so brutal to me. And uh, first of all, he never answered my questions. He always, uh, um, he always punished me for everything that I wanted to do. And um, his wife stood up and the wife said, Navid, he has recorded all your work. And every time that you were on, on the television, he would call me come come he's on television wow and every time he was watching your work he was saying that oh he was right and he used some of your footages that um that he liked to take it to the school and show it to the students i was uh i was speechless i was standing there and it shows how sometimes this the things that's happening in your life um, People, they hand you gifts and you don't understand the gift. You cannot decipher it. And your, maybe your ego more speaks up. And then, uh, and then I, I regret, that's one of my biggest regrets in my life that I never got the chance to go and thank him or at least to go and have a face-to-face conversation with him and thank him and tell him that if it wasn't because of him, I wouldn't have been where I am. I was just going to say, um, I have 30 <laughs> questions on this. To, I understand the ego concept because when someone kicks you out, you know, you, was this in, this was in US, right? You've just moved from many countries, which we'll get into. You're, you're trying hard. You're trying to break in and this guy kicks you out. And then for you to see it as the greatest gift speaks volumes of you and your mentality and also to thank him. I find that yeah. very rare. And for you to also see as a regret for not trying to uh, get in contact with him, when you could have just said, fuck this guy, I don't have anything to do with him. No, I couldn't. It was, uh, I remember, oh my gosh, I remember that day so vividly. I even know, I, 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 can, I can still feel his arm around my shoulder and how he grabbed me. I mean, that was one of those moments that it, I would never forget. Was and, it aggressive? Um, no, it was very, oh my gosh, he was very smooth. He came and said, come, come. And put his arms on. <laughs> and he kept walking with me and he said, leave my theater and never come back. And if you ever become famous, I don't want to hear about it. You want to take classes, go take classes from someone else, but not from me. So, so that was, and the funny thing is that uh, I've had some friends who stayed in that program. They finished the program. They, uh, they have their, um, they have their degrees and they are also uh, teaching at the universities. And um, sometimes when we sit and we talk, I mean, I do projects and I always try to bring my friends. I try to at least mention their names, give them the opportunity to, nice. to read for the project. And um, wow, it was, it was been a crazy journey. <laughs> I've got even, okay. I don't even know where we're going to break this down. And then you said some other points, which I want to get into, but I also, it's kind of like, I know you've been in Curb Your Enthusiasm, but it, this is to me kind of like a curb moment where you're going to, I don't know, send your wishes to like the family. You're going there and everyone's saying he's the nicest guy in the world, which I'm sure he was to them. And then you're there and you've probably created a bit of a scene. He, yes. Yeah. I, I mean, it was unbelievable. Everyone was looking at me and he says, what are you saying? And, <laughs> and they came up to me and some of them actually, they said that you were the ones who were in the same class they came up to me and they said that he he didn't even know what to do with you 
Oh, wow. You really didn't know what to do with you. You were out of control. You were doing your own thing. And he was kind of, he couldn't, he couldn't force his point of view to me. See, the thing is that sometimes when it comes, ah, to me, everybody who crosses my path is a teacher. Oh, was my yes. teacher. Yeah, I learned something from them. I, uh, I, I used to take a cup of coffee and I also used to tell my students that they should do that. I used to take a cup of coffee and go to the bus stop, sit at the bus stop, find someone who I've never seen before, somebody who has a different center of gravity and is moving differently or behaving differently that I've never seen before. Then I would start following the person from the distance. And the moment that I was able to get into his, embody his personality or his movement, and the way that he's behaving, that was my homework. I would walk away. So um, to me, there is no, I, I don't know, maybe I'm a gypsy actor. I, I traveled around wherever I got, where, wherever I was, I tried to find a teeny tiny hole, black hole in the wall and just go and try to figure out what do they do? How, how do they do this? And um, to me, there is no one, one way of doing the same thing. Uh, it's okay. always... Um, there is no technique. There is no, it's just a matter of being. It's a matter of being truthful. It's a matter of being honest to the moment, to the character, not to judge him. And um, what well, comes out is, it could be magic. Okay. Even more questions. This is the last point on the story. Do you think that by him recording you, that he could see the potential in you, but he didn't have potentially the emotional ability to explain to you that maybe I, you need to go in a different direction. I, I discovered that, I discovered that uh, after I left, yeah, years later. <laughs> yeah, you were years in the later. moment. And yeah. one of the things, um, it was another professor there. Um, his name was Russell St. Clair. He was teaching Shakespeare. So I was taking Shakespeare classes. And uh, it was very difficult for me. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, it was very difficult because, um, so all the other students, they were American. And uh, I was the one who was coming. I was speaking German, I was speaking Farsi, and my English wasn't that good. And I was. I was trying to learn Shakespeare. I was just trying to perform. I, I, I just wanted to do it. And uh, while it took someone half an hour, uh, it took me half a day for me to learn it uh, because I had this, I still have this book. It was this sonnet book, this dictionary of mm -hmm. Shakespeare that I'm sitting and going line by line, trying to translate, trying to figure out what am I saying? How am I saying it? How should I be saying it? And um, I remember uh, I talked about, I talked to, uh, about one, I mean, his name was, uh, the professor was, um, I, I don't know, I shouldn't even mention his name. Anyway, Russell, Russell pulled me aside and um, he said, why are you here? He said, I, I, I want to act. I, I, want to, I want to learn more. He said, I went to Royal Academy of Shakespeare. I have, I have been studying for past 20 years. And um, I am, uh, I'm a professor at the university. Uh, once in a while, I get to direct something. Um, but I haven't, I haven't acted for many years. I just kind of changed my direction. What is it that you want to do? I said, I want to be an actor. Uh, he said, literally, he looked up to me and said, what the fuck are you doing here? Then? Go out there. Wow. So don't, don't stay here. Just go. Because he could and say something or? Because he's the no, teacher and he's telling you not to learn. In a sense. No, what he, was, what he was telling me, he says that 
what do you, what else do you want to learn? He says you have enough to, and you have enough to go and try. Oh. As long as you don't, as long as long as you don't try, you are not going to find out. And one of the things that he was saying he was saying, uh, learn it by doing it. Yes, agreed. That's very powerful. Because there are lots of people. There are lots of people who are shying away from the from the outside world, and they are amazing, amazing actors inside their homes, inside the safe environment. And um, I don't know. I I always kind of I always broke the bridges behind me. I always cut the ropes, and no safety net. Just go and see what's going to happen. I want to I want to talk about that because it sounds like, and I've written many points and I've listened to you before that every time a door is presented, you either go through, and if a door if a door gets shut, you open many other ones. And I can see you smiling, and we could literally speak for probably six months on this, but to really like speak true to your story, it has not been easy for you at all. We should probably talk about your upbringing and how just all the challenges and hurdles along the way. And you mentioned not even having a safety net, not being able to speak English or then the different languages from the many countries. And I'll just give an example. You were born in Iran, then you moved to Turkey and Bulgaria, then Germany and then LA. And you didn't speak the native tongue. People probably would have thought that you were insane, but you still had something <laughs> in you where you kept on going. But and you started new at like five different countries. It's hard enough for one. Tell me your secrets. Uh, since I was a kid, I was, a, I, I was very curious. I wanted to see the world. And um, for me, it didn't matter what. I had no expectations. I went with no expectations. I knew what I wanted to do. And it took me a long time, and along the way, I've done many other things. And um, the door code that you told me, the door thing is, uh, to me, every door that closes is a road sign. It's either you go left or right. So uh, it doesn't mean that if the door slams on your, uh, on your face, you have to keep knocking on the door. Oh, well, it's closed. That's fine. No problem. Okay. I go to the right. And when I was traveling, everybody, um, I, was a, I was okay in the school. I did good. My parents, they wanted me to be a doctor. <laughs> yeah, and... Uh, I was very interested in dentistry and I wanted to be a dentist. And um, I studied biology. Um, and um, when I left, I just wanted to go. I wanted to be this guy who's, who's traveling around the world and with no, uh, uh, there is no borders. You just keep going one of those old travelers who would travel around the world to to learn and wherever i went i i learned something i mean the the funny thing is that sometimes my my daughter tells me um you come up and everything that i'm saying you you tell me how to do it you you know everything I said, no, honey, it's not that I know everything. It's just because I've done everything. So the things that you're doing, I'm not telling you that you have to do it my way. I'm just telling you a story. The same way that I learned by listening to someone else's story and use that as a tool and take it and use it and move forward. You can do that because sometimes we go and we try to discover everything um, and we are so, the one thing that I hate the most, there are a couple of words that I hate, but the one that I, that I hate the most is I know. Because you close off to receiving. Well, you, you, you don't know nothing. <laughs> You're yeah. right. And the other thing is I am, can't and don't and no. I mean, can't, uh, can't, why, why are you telling me that I cannot do something just because you couldn't do it? It doesn't mean that I cannot do it. 
So give me the tools. I want to, I want to fly. And instead of telling me that I cannot fly, help me to build the wings to fly. And then we will see that the possibilities are limitless. I mean, even the word impossible is, it tells you that I am possible. So these are, these are the things sometimes, I don't know, I'm, I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm crazy for me. Um, I'm, I'm hungry. I'm like a little kid. I just want to learn. I just want to learn more and more and more. And uh, I don't sleep that much. I spend most of my time trying to figure a new way, figure something new. Oh, okay, what, what is, how is this working? How does this work? Um, very curious. Uh, yeah. I've got a question on that. You're very similar to me, but this is something I've developed later in life. If someone says no, or it can't be done or it's impossible, and it's kind of like that arm out and there's not a discussion, I am revolted by it. I will not work with that person. I won't go near it. I won't be rude. It just, let's see how we can do it. And that's really important for me. And, you know, I've written at least seven scripts now and I've had a lot of people and, you know, I'm sure you've had like gatekeepers and people say yeah. it can't be done and they're exerting their power. Everything can be done if it's done in the right way or it can be done in a different way. But I just, it's just something where I just put my arms down and go, we're not meant to be, or this isn't meant to be together. Get rid of those negative energies. Exactly. Because the person who has a limit Yes. You will move forward based on that limit. Yes, you are who you surround yourself with in the sense. Yeah. Yeah. But what I find really awesome with you, this has come with a lot of work on my end to have that confidence. And I've, I've been in environments that can foster it. You would look on paper with your environment of how you kind of had to do everything on your own. I know you've had people help you along the way, but it sounds like you've just had this confidence and knowing that you're going to do whatever it takes in a loving, compassionate way to achieve your goals. Whereas normally, like for example, which we'll get into it, where you've worked odd jobs, you were in a refugee camp, you couldn't speak English and all the other languages, you still kept on moving forward. And it sounds like you didn't let the no stop you, whereas you probably would have got over 10,000 no's, but you still kept on moving forward. That is a very rare trait. And it's, the most magnificent trait? Is it something that you were Thank born you. with? Did you develop it? Do you ever consciously think about it? I, I think partially I owe it to my parents. I mean, my dad, he was a, um, he was a, um, he worked himself up first from the, um, working at the register in the bank. And then uh, he became a director of the bank. Oh, nice. And my mom was a principal, uh, was a teacher and then became a principal of the school. Um, but one of the things I remember is that I've had some incidents. I, I was, I was even during school, I was crazy. I would question everything. I would nice. question my teacher. I would question my director, the principal of the school. I, I would, I would walk up to principal of school and say, why do we have to do this? Hello. And can we do it this way? Can we do it that way? So I always try to find a, okay, don't misunderstand me. Uh, it's not me knowing everything, but it's me questioning everything. Are you trying to find a better way or a, a better just, way? Yeah, yeah, fully, fully respect that. Because if we wouldn't have done that, we wouldn't have ended up on moon. Yep. I mean, the people, you have to ask questions. You have to try to find a way. Okay, if this doesn't work, how, how can I make it work? So um, I remember uh, every time my dad was asked to come to the school, my dad would tell me, well, did I cause the trouble? I would say, no, he says, it's not my problem to come to the school. Why don't you go and solve it? Go and talk to them. Wow. So I had to go and take my punishments and uh, stand up for myself. And I was really, really kind of, it got to the point that I was, I was saying, fine, you don't want to come, don't come. I will do it myself. Then, years later, when I was in Germany, I ended up going back to Iran, and I went to my high school, and I went to my middle school, and I met with the principal of the school. I just went to see them. And when I was there, the principal of the middle school started laughing. 
while we were sitting, we were talking, we had a tea. And uh, he told me, you do know that all the punishments were dictated by your dad. <laughs> he would, <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. He would call us. He would call us. We would talk to him. He would call us and say, okay, this is what you should do. That's how it's supposed to be. This is what he has to learn. Then he would send me there, and I had to work my way around it, get out of it. Uh, For me, it was always, I think that was the, that was the biggest lesson. And then um, in my life, the things that I've seen, the P, I, I, I've had lots of friends that they gave up along the way. Yep. They, did, they ended up doing something else. And um, I think some of them, they were amazing. But to them, they felt entitled. They felt that, why shouldn't I have this? For me, is that I have to have this. I want to have this. So I worked for it. And um, I don't know. I mean, I've been lots of ups and downs. It's kind of a crazy thing. I mean, one of the craziest things that happened is that a few years back, I started uh, creating this... Um, Artist Community Center in Boyle Heights in um, kind of the south, uh, in downtown, it is east of downtown LA. Is this the Romany Road Artist Foundation? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I, um, and when I bought it, I was, I had a TV show, I had a contract, and then, uh, and then I got the place and I decided that I would change it and I would make it what I wanted to be. Yep. And COVID hit and uh, all my jobs got canceled. So I had to dig into the saving and just, I, I ended up doing, even if you look on the Instagram, you will see that I've been doing most of the work myself. So my journey prepared me for this task because I did everything from installation of the, uh, redoing the foundation and going up, doing the, uh, sealing the roof geez. and doing some plumbings and, uh, Fix building cabinets and uh, everybody, everybody was telling me, are you crazy? Let go of it. I mean, this, there is, there is no way. There is no way that you can make it. There is no way that it's going to work. There is no way that it's going to work. Some people, they came along the way, they were helping. And then even they were giving up because the task was so huge wow. that they were coming to help. And then they would see that, oh, no, is is scary. So they would come in for a couple of weeks and then they walk away. And um, I even got a I even got an offer to uh, to sell the place with the profit as it was. And for me, was that I made a promise. There are people who have told them this is what I will be doing. If I give up and if I let go of it, it means that my word has no value. So no matter what, I either gonna make it or I'm gonna I'm gonna break by trying doing it. And um, the center is finished. We have done some we have done some music videos some oh, cool. short films uh some people they came and they read their scripts they workshop their project uh, we do we do readings and um uh, the biggest success the story was that it was a um it was an iranian photographer who came and she uh, asked me i was still in the middle of the construction and she said oh yeah i have an idea for a picture but i don't have a place I said, why didn't you come here? I, um, I shut down the construction um, for one day. I said, you have one day to take all your pictures, do whatever you want to do. Wow. And I let, my, I let my assistant help her to set everything up. I said, I'm not even going to come in, so you are free to do whatever you want to do. Later on, which is all, I think is also on my presentation video somewhere for about Romani Road Center. We can upload um, a link if you, you can send me a website or an Instagram and we'll upload um, the episode. 
I'll talk to you afterwards, but I'll put in the episode okay. notes we so will, people uh, can check it out. And this is one of the oldest videos. I mean, it's an old video. It doesn't, um, yeah. it, they, um, she, she sent me a picture, a picture that she took in this teeny tiny studio in the middle of the construction was in the middle of Rotterdam as a huge poster in the middle of the city. And she was this teeny tiny next to the picture. And she wrote to me and she said, if it wasn't because of you, I would have never been here. Wow. And to me, that was well worth all the, all the headaches, all the troubles. I mean, if you look at, if you look at my Instagram, you will see I'm walking around with a, uh, with a bruised eye and uh, I hit my nose with a hammer and my eye was bleeding. Oh. It was crazy. I broke my finger. Hey, it was just <laughs> unbelievable. So, um, so we got done and everyone was telling me, you're an actor. What are you doing to your face? <laughs> well, why are you doing? I said, don't worry. It's just more characters. It adds more character. That's fine. <laughs> Let's just do it. And um, we got it done. We got it done. Okay. I don't even know where to stop it. You've got this like keeping, keep going mentality. Do you ever stop or give up? Have you ever had moments where you're like, I just can't do this anymore? Uh I have moments that I go into my cave. I have moments that I'm burned out. Of course. I, I go and I hide in my cave. I go and I take, for example, I, I, I take a pad and a pencil and I go and I start, start doing sketches. Um, I, my brain doesn't stop, but I disconnect from the whole world. I mean, I don't answer emails. I don't answer phone calls unless it's an emergency and I disappear. Is that and to energize yourself to get you? Yeah. 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 It just kind of, it, it's very difficult. Something you know, you're completely drained. I mean, I, okay. I never get tired of working, yep. but I get drained by negative energies around me. So by very all empathic. these negative, yeah. Yep. By all these negativities and even, um, I got some of the jobs that I got, if it wasn't because of me pushing, I would have never had those jobs. I mean, my, I changed a couple of teams, but my teams, the people who I was working with, all of them, they were, they were saying, oh no, they said no. They said no, so that's it. They, there's nothing we can do. And so what are you talking about? There's nothing we can do. I have to, I, I mean, at least, Give me an opportunity to talk to them. Yep. Let them see what I can give them. And understand, I never, in my entire career, I've been doing this since 80, 86 Jeez. in Germany. In my entire career, I never walked into a room asking people, giving me a job. I always walked in and I said, let me show you what I got. Yeah. I mean, I, you're, you're searching for this character. You're searching for this. Um, you, can, you can limit yourself by going by what is safe, but sometimes going outside the box, that's what makes it interesting. And we are about creating illusions. We are about creating, telling a story. So uh, let's just try why not? I mean, I've done, I've done tons of crazy shit. I, I, I wouldn't recommend it to any, any of you <laughs> actors out there. Please don't do what I did at home. <laughs> I, I actually have an example I want to talk about. But just before that, it sounds like you go in that you know you, you're very well prepared. You want to show them what you do to the best of your abilities. What happens when you get a no and it's an actual no? Do you take that personally? Can you move forward? Of course, no. I, that no doesn't make a difference to me. Even the yes doesn't make a difference. For me, what's important is being able to be seen. I cannot, uh, okay, see, the thing is that I cannot um, force you. I cannot force you to choose me. I cannot force you to work with me. 
You don't want to work with me, that's fine. But at least see what you're missing. Ooh. So that's let's talk. For me, every time I'm walking into the audition room, or I used to walk in the audition rooms, and every time that I have a meeting, it's not about me getting a job. That meeting was the job. Whatever comes next after that is okay. It's the icing on the cake. For me, even when I went to the audition, I've been to the auditions that I sat down and chit-chatted. Literally, I walked out of the audition recommending another actor and handing them a headshot of another actor who's right now a dear friend of mine and that kind of... Uh, kind of restarted restarted his career. I, I walked into a room, I had a very nice chat with the, um, with the casting director and while we talked, I, because I knew, I also knew that my friends were struggling. So I went there and um, That's very kind of said, you. thank you so much, thanks for having me here, but you know, I think this is your guy. Ah, uh, who are you? So that person, booked that job, uh, got paid well, got him out of some holes and um, boosted his career. And he's, he's, one of, he's one of my dearest friends. I mean, for him, he, and he jumps in no matter what. He, he was one of the people who, without questioning me, he was telling me I'm crazy, but without <laughs> questioning me, every time I called him and I said, I need this for the center. The next day it was there. Oh, wow. And um, it's, been, it's been good. Well, it's, and it sounds like with your um, studio, the foundation, that you kind of have the mentality of this collaboration where if someone does well and you do well, or not even that you're thinking about that, where if someone achieves something like that example you gave with the photographer, then it lifts you up in some way. You might not get money, you might not get a job, but it helps you, which sounds like a higher power, a higher way of being, which is how I would like the world to be, but not everyone's why I'd like no, that. The thing is that, okay, you're sitting on the top of the wall. You have all this power. You have all this money. And you have everything. Everything that you, everything that you wish, you have it. What do you want to do with it? Mm. You're not going to take it with you. Uh, I always said, I said, I, I came to this, into this world naked. I will leave naked. I'm not going to take anything with me. So why don't we, why don't we kind of pay it forward? Why don't we make it difference? The difference that you're making, my dad used to tell me, he was saying that it doesn't matter how much money you have, um, your money will go very quickly. What's important is, um, is your name, is your legacy. How many lives have you been able to change? Uh, because, uh, okay, I used to teach. I used to teach and I was spending lots of time I mean, I, in those classes. And I've had some some people walked up to me and they were saying, why, why the hell are you teaching? Why are you here? Do you even have time to do that? Um, why don't you go out there and do it? I said, I can be on my own. I can be in front of one camera. I can be on one stage. But I have 20 students here. Now I can be in front of 20 cameras on 20 stages and for me seeing them succeed is um oh, i don't know it's just oh i was able to i was able to do it it's like that because i i don't know maybe because i didn't have it so that's why i want i want to give it that's why i want i want to show people who they did who they didn't give me the opportunity what is the right way? Uh, maybe, I don't know. Maybe I'm trying to say, you see, I discovered this. I, if this person would have knocked on your door, you, you would have turned 
turned away because it doesn't, it might not look based on what you think it should look. I, I don't know. I, no, no, I, no. I mean, there is a, there is a saying, um, you can see the truth when you're blind and you can hear the truth when you're deaf. The problem is that we are going in with preconceived notions based on what we have heard, what we have learned, what, uh, what we should expect. So nothing in life is, you cannot prepare yourself for anything in life. You can be, uh, okay, uh, you, can be, you can be prepared in a way that you have done your homework, but what happens at that given moment, that's a split second. That's right there at that moment. It happens and it's gone. So if you're sitting and thinking about doing it and not doing it, that moment that you were supposed to be doing it is already gone. Yep. Not being in the moment present. It's interesting, you know, we've, we were speaking about power, but also I forgot, I'm going to butcher this quote. What is it? See the world that you want. Be the world, see the world that you want to be. Uh, I'm butchering it. I can't, I'm having a blank, but you know. Okay, uh, let me tell you what I, yeah, this yeah. is, that, that's very, that's, that's correct. That's, be the world that you want to see. Yes, yes. Okay, but one of the things that happened is that I was very outspoken. I always got myself in trouble, even when I was in school um, and my dad, I mean, oh my gosh, I, I would get suspended, especially after the revolution. I would get suspended left and right. And my dad would come and tell me, why didn't you finish and just walk away? Why, 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 do, you, why do you try to make change? I said, dad, I'm not trying to change anything. I'm trying to change myself. I want to be different than what they are. If anybody wants to join me, they are more than welcome. They can come along. If they don't want it, they are free to live their life the way that they want to live their life. But, but see, the thing is that always we look and we say, well, um, if that person is not doing it, why should I do it? Oh, this is not the norm. Oh, this is not, this is not the standard. Who set up those standards? Who set up those norms? And who 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 was the person who told you you can and you or you cannot do something i don't know i think that you do know because throughout like you know when you're younger and you're questioning everything it's, it's you trying to figure out a better way to be and by you changing your world you actually change the world around you which you've done with many other things as well and that comes with the questioning that comes with you being true to yourself and also seeing the preconceived ideas and belief systems where we've all got it, no judgment to anyone, we, but everyone has these belief systems which they blindly follow. And so when you have someone like you question it, it actually does wonders to an open-minded person because they're like, oh, I've got this. Why do I have this? Let's question it. Let's see if it's real. Why is it there? And that's, in my opinion, very crucial for the artist or just someone wanting to live a better life as well. So you are creating that better world uh, but but you do understand that I'm even questioning myself. Yeah, of course. You have to it's not that I'm questioning this, uh, my surrounding environment. I'm always questioning. If I've done something in a certain way, then I start questioning, is there, is there a better way? So let me do it differently. Uh, sometimes when I'm driving, Blindly, I can drive and I can find my way because that's the way that I've been going back and forth. But there are times that I, I just turn right. And then I try to find my way. I go into the alleyways and sometimes when I go into the alleyways, I see the most beautiful architecture. It's something different and it's incredible. I, I want to see, I want to learn, I want to see different things. So if I keep doing exactly the same thing again and again, the same routine, then I will become my routine and I will never grow. So where does this growth mentality come from? Is it a spiritual thing? Is it a religious thing? 
we don't see that. It sounds like you're not self-critical in the sense where you're negative. You just got this like puppy dog. You're a child in a positive way where you're like, oh, what can happen here? If I do this, then this can happen. But all coming what sounds like from joy, not from a critical, I did this badly. Nope. Therefore, Yeah, that's, I want to try and understand this mentality because there are, there are a few people in this world that have this and it's a characteristic that I admire. But to build away that negative chitter chatter, that negative noise and go back to the play and the fun, that's the goal of life. You found the meaning. <laughs> is that also a parent thing? Is it a religious thing? Is it a spiritual thing? Is it a life experience thing? Is it all the above? I don't. I maybe all of the above. Is okay. I was a kid who took a screwdriver and poked into the outlet, electrical outlet, <laughs> and I popped the fuse. I'm, I'm seriously. <laughs> I'm the kid. I'm the kid who emptied the whole gas can into the sink and I walked away and I tried to light the match because I heard that the gas can do it. <laughs> you should have seen my parents, they came home, oh. the whole kitchen, literally, uh, please do not know, but you guys shouldn't try it. It's very dangerous, especially when the gas turns liquid and goes into the pipes. Yeah. Then blow up every, every, yeah. My, the whole sink was upside down and the pipes that were coming out and my face was burned and I was running, I was 12 years old. I was running around the yard because I couldn't touch my face, it was burned. And my aunt came and by the way, if you have a burn, you can use potatoes. <laughs> it, it softens the skin, <laughs> it's very nice. Okay, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> so, no, I'm serious. No, Look I at believe my face. you. I, and um, I mean, that's, that's who I am. It is not, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. God, universe, whatever you believe in has given you this beautiful instrument. It's fascinating when you look at it, it's more complicated than any computer that you have ever created or invented. Are we, are we at our, fullest potential or we did we did we meet that limit that there's no no other place to go um i uh, i i learned i told you i learned from people I've, I've sat down with so many different people from so many different backgrounds and i'm sitting and i'm each of them, they have their own way. Um, I travel around the world and I work. And when we travel, sometimes some of the countries that we are going, they give us this huge booklet of do's and don'ts. The things that you should be doing in this country, the things that you shouldn't be doing in this country. And this was written by someone who looked into this country and is their understanding of this country. Uh, so every time that I was there, I just kind of, I, 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 threw, the the book away. I, <laughs> I threw the book away yeah. and I just walked out and I just went there. I have friends in places that some people might have not even heard the name of this place. And these people, they welcomed me into their homes. They told me their stories and they showed me how to do things. Oh my gosh. Um, I, I went to the desert and I was in a desert for a week in, uh, in, uh, in Morocco. And I met this Bedouin man who, was, who showed me how they dig out the fossilized roots of the trees or vegetations in the desert and how they turn that into the ring and jewelry. Oh. And I was there, I was sitting fascinated. I mean, this thing that comes out that looks like nothing, and I have one of those rings. And it looks this into this beautiful, magnificent piece of art. We when I was a kid, we used to go, we used to get go get those um those boxes, the, um, the wooden fruit boxes, 
them that they carry the fruit in it from the market and go to the mechanic shop and just get a couple old bearings and put them and that was my go kart i would it is a one time kart you get down it's done it's finished but um but we were we were trying to discover new things i think that people sometimes they are they're happy with what it is i know what i know i don't need to know more ignorance is bliss it's, type thing yeah that's it I'm, I, I've just, never been like that. Which I admire you for. It's a great mm -hmm. trait to aspire to have. I'm also thinking out loud. When you were in Iran, I don't know when you left. I assume you were a child. 85. The... 85. Yep. I left in 85. I was 20 years old. Oh, 20. Okay. I thought you were younger. I would also imagine, and I don't know enough about the revolution. We only hear what snippets are in the media. And there's always so much more that's not spoken about. During wars, people don't tend to go to the arts. That's like the first thing that falls because it's all about like safety and security and just trying to survive. But you still had this play and this mentality where it sounds like, and you please correct me if I'm wrong, where you could have that at the forefront of your mind that you wanted to do creativity and acting. That's also quite unique because often you're in this huge survival state. So I'm very curious of how, you know, you could have gone a completely different direction, understandably, when you're going through an experience or experiences like that, but you, you still chose the play and the fun and didn't go to that survival-like mentality. Well, if it's... Let me ask you a question. Tomorrow is your last day that you're alive. What are you going to do? a very good question i'd be doing this in screenwriting so then you will just be doing the writings is there anything else that you want to do anything that you have always wanted to do and you never did to create to build the screenwriting into whatever it is for me i live my life as if as if the last day so i have nothing i have nothing to um I have nothing to worry about. Uh, fear. Um, yes, that's what I was looking for. Fear is um, don't be a slave to your fear. Don't uh, don't allow your fear dictate what's going to happen to you next. Um, I was afraid of heights for some reason. And when I came here, I went, um, I started doing stunt work when I was also in Germany. I was very, I was, I was physically, I was, I was okay. I was good. And um, when I went down to, I was in San Diego, it was a stunt group and I was trying to work with them. And um, I started doing high falls. Every time I was going up, I was literally, I was shitting my pants. I was standing on the edge. I was saying, ah, ah. And that was giving me such a freedom while I'm falling down. Back in 98, uh, it's somewhere, I still have the pictures. It's somewhere, uh, that was right when I was doing the movie Boundaries. I was driving to Mexico. We shot that movie in uh, Mexico, in Tecate. Uh, so, in Tecate and San Diego. So we went to Tecate and as I was driving, our first AD was sitting next to me and the first AD was telling me, why don't you wear your seatbelt? You should wear your seatbelt. Why don't you wear your seatbelt? I said, you want to wear your seatbelt? Wear your seatbelt. I don't feel comfortable wearing a seatbelt and I don't wear a seatbelt. Not wearing a seatbelt will save my life. She started laughing at me and we went to Takata. We finished the, move, uh, the shoot that day. And on the way back, it was around 8, 39 o'clock. I was coming back. There is a two lane road, no railing. And it comes down the mountain. Uh, old Tempo Road, 94. And 
I was coming down and the car was coming. I don't remember what's happening. I bent down to look at something and I came up and all of a sudden the car was tumbling down the hill. Broke all the trees. So this was the hill. I went on from the side of the road. I started rolling. There were trees here, broke the trees, and then the car went straight down. And when you're in an accident, in an accident like this, everything is slow motions. Uh, you see everything in a very, very, you see even the vibration of the leaves that you, your car hits it. And um, I wasn't wearing my seatbelt. Nobody else was in the car. And I have pictures that the steering wheel of my car is bent. And I have no idea what has happened. I, I pulled my shoulder. So the car started rolling. My legs are hitting left and right. And I don't let go of the steering wheel. And the car started rolling. And then it went head down. And as it was going head down, I could, I could see the ground is coming closer to me. And at that moment, I've never felt that peaceful in my wow. life. I just went down. The car went down and hit the rock. I ejected through the windshield. The only thing that I have is just a cut on the back of my neck that's <laughs> left. After that. So I, the car hit the rock. I, I just let go of the steering wheel. I don't know how. I covered my head and I fell down and I turned and the car is coming down. And I cannot move. I'm just laying there. I'm just looking at this car that's coming, falling on the top of me. The car came down. It was a rock on the other side. I was between two rocks and the car fell down on top. I have pictures of this car. This car is like you're taking a matchbox and you're twisting just it like chase. this. And I came out of it. I climbed back up to the hill, uh, uh, to the side of the road. I fell down 150 feet. I climbed back up. One of the producers, left the lens cap at the, at the location. He, apparently he went back to Mexico to get the lens and come back. That gave, him, gave me the time to come all the way back up. And he saw me and he took me to the um, high road patrol and then um, we went to the hospital. As I was going down, there were so many things playing in my head. There were so many things that, oh, I, I wrote down, I remember the note that I wrote, the thing that I was supposed to do, the thing that I wanted to do. And, oh, I didn't say goodbye to that person. I, uh, who should I call? And then, oh, this is what I wanted to do. And all these things. I had one of those flip phones, the ones that you can... Uh, uh, write your own greeting notes when you open it, one of the old ones, you open it, you see the greeting on the top of it. Yeah. So on that phone, I wrote, today is tomorrow. And that was my greeting to myself. We go around, we always say, that we're gonna do, I'm going to do it tomorrow. I'm going to do it tomorrow. I'm going to do it tomorrow. What if tomorrow doesn't show up? So you live your life as if your last day in, uh, on this earth. Do what you want to do, how you want to do it. And you are free to do whatever you want to do as long as your freedom doesn't take away from my freedom. Who cares? Do it's very, you want to do. very well said. And I, I have two questions. Was it because you weren't wearing a seatbelt that saved your life? Yeah. Even the highway patrol came and said that if, if you were wearing a seatbelt, you, uh, you wouldn't have survived it because you would have crashed in the car. Jeez. And you had that insight of knowing. Very interesting. I, had, I, nev I never forget that conversation. I was driving and I had this conversation and she was the one who told me. And even when, when we won the at slam dance, the director went up there. I had to, because I dislocated my shoulder, I had to play a tr play trombone during the movie. And we had only one week left. The trombone was about 50 years old. So when they wanted to take me to the hospital, I refused to go to the hospital. I said, someone has to go down there and get that trombone because the movie, we cannot finish the movie without that trombone. The trombone was in my car. 
So um, when the, actually the firemen, they are credited in the movie, I think, when they came to check into the hospital, they went down and these poor guys in the middle of the night, they threw a rope, they went all the way down there and they found the trombone, wow. they brought the trombone up. And I shot the last part of the movie. I have a bracelet under my arm, so I keep the arm. So if you look at it, my trombone doesn't move. I don't move my hands like this. My hand moves just like this. I shot the movie with my shoulder taped and all those things. And it would have been very painful. Direct, it was, but it was that film. That film did great. That film did great. I have once again a thousand questions, but just on the peace side, what were you? You said you felt this peace. Can you explain that to me? It sounds like a near death experience. It was. It was soft. I could feel the leaves. Even even when I was hitting left and right, it was painless. And I think it kind of, it was a matter of accepting it. It is what it is. That's, uh, I cannot that's, do anything about it, so let's go with it. You're tumbling to potentially your death and you're at peace. That's very... It was, I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling most people, they, I'm, I'm telling them they, they are more shocked than I am when I'm telling them the, uh, the story, but <laughs> I, can see. I had no control over it. So why should I worry about it? I, I couldn't do anything except what I was doing. Just hold on tight and go for a ride. <sighs> okay, I've got even more questions. I actually don't even know where to start because, I, okay, we'll, we'll skim through some stuff. It's very interesting, you know, you bring up how the firemen went out of their way to bring that trombone, which is an awesome story. I also, maybe we should do a bit of a timeline, but I think, you're, uh, I think you're in Germany. You've just come out of a refugee camp and you're not allowed to work for whatever the visas. And I don't quite, I can see you smiling. You probably know where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you tell me why you're smiling and then I'll tell you what I was I, Getting that job was crazy the very first time. I, uh, I, you tell me because maybe I'm saying something different. No, but I want to hear you, you smiling. You're going to miss so your I, phone. <laughs> no, no, I'll bring up my point if it's not the right one. It was a beautiful, it was a beautiful moment. I was very crazy. I, I got myself a dictionary a German a Farsi, and I would go to the Auslander Amt, uh, and I would sit at the door and sit in the lobby uh, to translate for other, for other Iranians, uh, because there were not that many Iranian translators there. So if it was somebody there, I would go in with my dictionary, I try to translate, say what they want to say and all. So I, I befriended everyone. And, uh, and then uh, Rheinland Falls Theater, um, in Germany, I, in Iran, I was introduced to mime by a friend of mine who was deaf. He took oh, me to his theater company and I fell in love with it and I started learning from them. And I studied with them, I played with them. I even, I was able to do sign, Iranian sign language, which I forgot, I don't even remember it anymore. Oh, wow, and, um, and then, um, the director, uh, they were doing Sunday in Park with George. They were looking for someone who's the same size as the actor, George, when he's singing and he's traveling through the park, telling his story, um, is fading from one location to another location. And the director was looking for someone who can play that fade to be there and physically and emotionally take over as George goes through the scene, goes from behind the curtain, comes in from the other location to the other spot. Um, so I went and I auditioned and I got the part and then I went to the Ausland around and I said that I don't, uh, I don't want social health. I don't want social health is the money that they're giving to the refugees. I said, I don't want the money and I, um, uh, I can take care of myself, please. I just want to work in a the theater. Um, this is the theater, so that's where I want to go. And um, I, uh, um, 
I was able to get a um, dual work permit and a substandard arbiter of this, um, which means uh, you, you can uh, you can be your own boss. You can do whatever you want to. Because at that time they would allow the refugees to work, but the refugees they would they would do only one job. That that's a specific job, and I wanted to, I needed to do multiple jobs in order to survive. If I'm not getting a social helper, yeah. and um, so I was the first one in the group who got that, and I went to the theater, and I remember when we opened, um, the chief and some of the some of the people from Austin there, um, they showed up with the flowers. They came to the theater, so for me it was a. a it has always Germany has always played a very uh, very pivotal moment in my life and in my journey. And I always said, uh, sometimes they're asking me, why, why do you go and work in Germany? Why do you want to work in Germany? Um, even the salary is not, is completely different. <laughs> yeah, of course. But uh, you need to understand Germany allowed me to find myself, to become who I am. So for me, the closest thing to home is Germany. Oh, wow. Every time I go, every time I go there, I uh, relight the fire inside. Uh, there, there are times that, I, there are times that I, I just go to Germany, I rent a car, and I go to all those theaters, all those apartments, all those places that I lived, all my friends, I just, literally, I drive for about 10 days and I go from one place to another place to rediscover or uh, reconnect with me. How and be- that, amazing. Well, how, how beautiful is that? First of all, I doubt you can even speak German properly. And you're like begging to these authority, authority figures, please, I just want to work. One, you're kind of downplaying how hard this is. You're in a refugee camp. I have no idea what goes on there, but I doubt that that's easy. I'm sure that was scary as well. You're then gone through that experience and then you're trying to like just make ends meet. And I think you're a cab driver. You painted houses, you did landscaping, cleaned toilets, and God knows what else you did to survive in Germany. I can send you some pictures. Yes, I would, I would, I would love that. But you, to, to me, just the way that you gloss over it, like that, that's the journey, that's the story in terms of the hardships. But you don't see it that way. You just see it as life and allowed you to move forward and you put in your craft. You have this beautiful mentality and positive outlook. And then I'm sure just after going through all of that and then you see these, then bringing the flowers and seeing you in the, the play, that's just beautiful all around. That whole experience is just so lovely to hear as well. Thank you. It was, it was an amazing journey. I, I enjoyed it. All the ups and downs and made me a better person. Wow. And very quickly, I, I know this is another podcast in itself, what were you going through mentally when you're in a refugee camp? Because I have no idea what goes on, especially that. I had a couple, I made a couple of good friends there. Um, it was very, it was very difficult. The camp still exists. But when we were there, uh, is an Ingelheim camp. Um, when we were there, it was kind of like a, these, um, kind of like a pre-made containers that it was divided and four people in one room. And uh, um, a fence all around, barbed wires on the top. And um, we were, uh, there's a friend of mine, Akbar Azarfar, uh, and Lily, his wife, all three of us, we were there. Lily was from Romania. And she was a young girl. She was, she was very young. And, um, and she's beautiful. She was beautiful. She is beautiful. And at that time, they were um, in that camp. There were lots of shady things going on inside. There's an inner, there's a inner, 
I, how to say, there is an inner business is, okay, you're in the refugee camp, but inside the refugee camp, then you have all these different uh, power. Uh, oh, so like politics within it. Yeah, po politics, in, because there were all different uh, nationalities in this yeah. camp. So uh, everybody, they were trying to have their own territory and create their own profit and make their own money. And, uh, and um, Lily, um, we met Lily and then Lily came, uh, came and she was spending lots of time with us. And uh, Akbar and Lily, uh, they got married. Right when we came out of the camp, they both got married and um uh, three beautiful kids i love them to death and um with akbar akbar used to um uh, used to teach martial arts in iran and then for a while he was also training a couple of teams in germany when he came out and um i used to do some some martial arts back home um uh, and okay. um back home in iran and there were, it was a hole under the fence. Um, just imagine we were these wild animals inside the cage. And I never forget one day, Akbar and I, we went through the hole under the fence. We went out at night when everything was shut down and we just started running. We run for hours. We got to the mine, uh, to the river. We got to the river, we put our feet inside the river, and then we looked at each other and we said, shit, now we have to get back before they open it. <laughs> and we, saw, we, we struggled just to get ourselves back before, before they opened the gates and before the, the day started again. That's how we, that's how we, we survive. I think that was that the core, the connection. The, the, I think Akbar and Lily and I, we we became kind of like a family while we were there. It was a family that we chose for ourselves, and um, we kept supporting each other. And still to this day, I mean, I can pick up the phone and just call Akbar. I know it doesn't matter what it is; he will jump in. That's beautiful. And. Um, it was a it was a different time. It was a different time. It was uh, I mean, I, when I left Iran, I uh, I remember in Turkey there were no rooms, no hotels, nothing, nothing was available, and it was a it was a toilet. The toilets in Turkey are this Middle Eastern toilets, the hole in the ground, oh. and um, it was a toilet in the middle of the hotel, in the middle of the lobby with no windows, nothing. And they put a board on the top of it and a bed inside it. And that's the one that I could afford. So it was so that when, when I wanted to leave the room, I had to put my suitcase on the top of the bed, open the door, come out, and then go back in, close the door, put the suitcase behind the door wow. in order to be able to sleep. Um, the, it, it, it kind of humbled me in a way. When I left Iran, I, had, I, I think I had um, two suitcases, a duffel bag, and a backpack. By the time that I got to Germany, I just had my duffel bag. Inside my duffel bag, there were my books and my backpack. That's, that's what it was, a, couple, a change of shirts and underwear, and I let, I let go of everything. I, detach myself from all the material stuff. Wow. I didn't care about it. It has been a uh, Sounds like it's crazy been an interesting trip. journey. It has been beautiful. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask one last question on, on that. Sure. Yeah, but sure. I, I would also imagine, and I'm not comparing the situations, you know, you got through a revolution. I'm sure mentally that was also tough. I know you've got this amazing outlook, but I'm sure the conditions at this refugee camp, you mentioned there were like politics and power structures. What were you thinking? What was kind of key? I know you had your family there, but what kept you being positive? Was there something you're looking forward to outside? What kept you going and not wanting to give up? 
Well, I knew that this is not the end. I knew that something more is coming. Uh, you always uh, there. All right. Uh, when your time is up, is up. Until then, nothing will stay the same. My dad used to tell me, um, when you're so unhappy with where you are, look down. There are hundreds of people who they want to be where you are. And when you are so full of yourself that you think you are on the top of the world, look up. There are millions of people above you. So just, just keep going. It doesn't matter. I never compared myself to anybody else. I never wanted to be anybody else. I wanted to be me. I, I, I never tried to copy someone else. I, uh, it's, it's me. I, I could speak to you about that, just the mentality side for, at least, as I said, at least six months. But I can call us. Anytime. We can chat. When I we appreciate are it. I will definitely do a part two with you because yeah. we've only glossed yeah. over so many things. Yeah. And maybe f- like even just as a throwaway comment, I think you're even, you know, you've moved through all these countries, you learned the language, then you go to LA, you're reestablishing yourself there. You can't even speak English there. And that in itself, there's more challenges. I think you're living in your car. And you were living in your car and you went to, what was it, a gym center and you, you were showering, handing out your, um, the pictures, what are they My called? resume. Your resume. resume and headshot. You've, you've gone through many lives, my friend, and it is beautiful for me. It's going to be extremely empowering for the audience to hear that no matter what, that you, you've seen these roadblocks and you've been able to, as you said, gone left and right and still live this extremely fruitful life. But added to that, that you also want to give back and help your community or people along the way. And you gave that example with the um, foundation, with the lady of how, uh, how appreciative she was of you and how good you felt. And I think that's kind of what life's all about. So that's not a question. That's just a compliment. I wanted to ask Thanks. one thing before we do the rapid fire segment. And I know you've spoken about this a lot, so I'll try and ask it in a different way or, or we can speak about it another way. You've played many, at times you've been pigeonholed and we can all be pigeonholed in this industry, rightfully or wrongfully, but it seems you've been able to embrace the villain side. I want to hear your thoughts on that. And then I also want to talk about Legion because to me, this was the greatest villain to kind of like an anti-hero I've ever seen, especially in the Marvel world. And I've watched everything. So I want to kind of know your relationship with that i know it's quite loaded but we'll intertwine things along the way i okay let's go uh to a very quick first of all i never play a villain i always play the man it's it's up to you how you see and how you look at it um if you remember i told you um the worst thing is for you to go uh, with a preconceived notion and judge the character the journey of the character Today, when I started this conversation with you, first of all, I didn't know my assistant told, oh, by the way, is on camera. I said, what, on oh, camera? So I'm, I'm <laughs> sitting, I, she said, no, 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 is, 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 it, is, it, is it video? I said, okay, fine, I'm just gonna go wash my face and take a shower and then sit there. Okay. Um, my, my pleasure. Uh, but see, the thing is that the, uh, the moments that's happening, um, for me, I, I don't know, it, when I embody the character, the moment that the character becomes real, then it's not Navid anymore. And if it's not Navid, so who am I to judge that character? Because everybody thinks that they are, they are being just. Yep, we all think so. So, yeah. um, so that's, how I, that's how I play the character. And um, playing, being, pigeonholed uh, it's somebody has to play them uh, and um, I started I started literally I started with comedy and musicals and then I ended up being the big bad wolf on which I don't have a problem with it but uh, the big bad wolves that I played all of them they had a it was something it was something about them it was there are layers I walked away I walked away from projects. I walked away from decent projects or projects that would have made a huge impact on my career. 
I walked away from them because, uh, because the character, the way that it was written and the way when I talked to them, I saw, no, that's what they want to see. They just want to see one layer, just these vicious men who's coming and screaming and shooting. So I'm not going to do that. Because this, there is a reason that he's becoming the way that he is. Show the reason that I will play the man. Sorry for cutting you off. And that's credit to you with the homeland. Uh, what's his name? Abu Nazir? Abu Nazir. I haven't Abu seen Nazir. it in ages, but I remember your role quite vividly. Thanks. And that showed layers towards a character that perhaps we've, I'd never seen and I rarely seen since, is to play that additional, why is this character being this person, not just being in inverted commas, a terrorist. And that Thank was you. a game changer. Anyway, yeah. go, go on. Yeah. I uh, he, was a, he was a man. He was a father. He was a teacher. He studied politics, uh, political science. And uh, to me, the way, that I, the way that I saw him is that there is a reason. So play the, play the man with his journey, and that's what made him who he was. Um, and... And I, I played, I played variety of the roles. So one of the things was that um, it is funny. I'm, I'm just saying it. Please don't misunderstand me. Uh, years ago, I was sitting. I was, in, I was sitting at home, and I would make do makeup, change my face, do all the different things when I had nothing else to do. So I have about. 10, 15 different kind of wigs and makeup, beard, different size of mustaches, and sit and play with it. And <clears throat> I would also entertain my kids with it. I would come in from different faces. And um, my, I always wanted this, the title, Man of a Thousand Faces. Yes. I for me, was... Uh, Oh yeah, look at me. I'm I'm this. I can be this. I can be that. And, and for me, when it comes to acting, is that as long as it's not specifically in the, uh, there's a specific reason for the character to be specific race or nationality. There is, there are no limitations. I mean, why the character cannot be this? Cannot be that? We have so many. We have so many police officers who are who are Afghani in America. Afghani police officers, uh, Iraqi police officers, Iranian police officers. You know, we have an Iranian detective, who I know. So, why, why always uh, in, the, um, in the shows um, you have a uh, you have a white, black, Mexican, or Asian? These are the detectives, and then everything every other color it just becomes the the villain yeah. so unfortunately our industry um, yeah, even though that we are here to create the illusion our vision is a little bit Boxed limited it. and narrow yes, exactly and um so i some of those roles i had to i had to fight for my brain Brain on fire, okay, brain on fire, uh, Dr. Najo is from Syria, but I did a, I, I worked on the project, the name of the character is Keith. I walked into the room and I did it and they were very happy with it. And um, the writer said, oh, you know, I can, um, I can change the character. Uh, I can change the character, change the name of the character, the background of the character and this and that. And then the producer, uh, the executive producer said, no, my grandfather was a refugee. Uh, I was an immigrant. My grandfather came over here. He ch changed his name. He took an American name, but he had the accent, and he lived his life as an American guy with a different background. So this is what America is about. And I, I got the part. He said, no, you are my, my kid, and I, you don't need to change the name. This is what, what he's going to play. It's, it all depends on who, how open-minded the person who's making a decision is. We've had a number of guests talk about this as well. But, and even in the best of times, I'm just using examples, someone can be pigeonholed as a nerd and that can be very frustrating. I know you've done many, many, many other roles, but I would still imagine that it could be quite frustrating. And I know you've added your level and your dimension to all the characters that you play. 
But I'm sure at one phase in your career or maybe other phases where it might be a bit, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, annoying or frustrating, or I don't know what the right word is, if someone's saying like do this and do this role when you're trying to like bring out or show the character in a different lens, that would annoy me personally, I, but I'm not. Of course, but it never annoyed me. Oh. Because each of these characters that I played, they had something inside them that made me fall in love with them. Ah. So, the so I, 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 I went in and I said, okay, you want me to be the villain? That's fine. And to be very honest with you, each of those characters, they became my teachers. They helped me to look at the world and the situations from different perspectives and not judge, not, not be judgmental. And after a while, when you, when you play all these things, we have demons inside. All of us, we have demons inside. And you, uh, you recognize those. And then you know how to harness them. Um, I'm a very... Uh, it takes a lot for me to lose my cool. So <laughs> most of the people that will react to it like that with me, I'm just sitting and I'm looking at them. And I say, okay, let me see. Why is he so angry at me? Where is he coming from? I, that being people who they pulled me into the secondary and they did a search. I, I went there. I didn't have a problem. And the problem is them because they are, they are scared. Always comes back it wasn't me, it was the, their fear. Yep. Let them do it. That's fine. I can get a free massage. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I like, will laugh about it. I like, I like that. I mean, you're cool as a, I forgot what the term is, but you're a very cool guy, very relaxed. If you can be at peace when you're flipping in a car, you've been through <laughs> wars, you've been through refugee camps, living in your car, I don't think much would phase you. Some of the some of the things um, these are these are words, okay? Um, the words they trigger a reaction inside you, and you react to to your understanding from the word. Yeah. So if you um, it's up to you how you interpret what you hear. What is the translation for you? Uh, I don't know. Maybe I see the beauty of each word and the way that I'm using it or the way that's being used. So, okay, let me see where is it coming from. There have been, there have been times, there have been times that I was, I, I, I snap, and my snap is just very cold. I shut down. I don't even pay attention to the person anymore. And I just walk away. I, I'm, I'm done with this person. If the person is that ignorant, if I want to, if I engage, it means that I will scoop down to his level. Why yeah. would I want to do that? Yeah. I'll let him be. It's done. If he doesn't understand, he doesn't understand, and there's nothing I can do to, to change it. I try. If it doesn't work, I say, God bless you. Thank you so much. Good luck. I done. like that. It means, you, as you said, you don't go to that same level. And I think that's very important to know when to like cut the cord. This is the last question before we do a rapid fire segment, if we've got time talking about Legion. And to me, this spoke volumes. Well, it spoke volumes about you as an actor and your performance as well. But to me, this character, which could have been a typical inverted commas villain. And I know that your perception of what a villain is, but the way that you brought life and how the character developed as a hero, it's very, especially in Marvel, it's normally the villain twirls his moustache and just wants to kill everyone. But there was such life and beauty in this character and you could see, I guess, the other side. I've never seen a villain a super, in a superhero film where the villain somewhat becomes the good guy and you see this other element and there's so many layers. I thought that was brilliant. What did you think when you kind of got this role? I know it was in season two and then season three, the character evolves, but that would have been just a crazy. Um, first of all, I have to give all the credits to Noah, Noah Hawley and his, um, the, our writing staff. Um, that character was, um, that character had a, had a crazy journey 
and it became completely different. Uh, even I had some people who walked up to me and they said, oh, we never saw this character. We never saw, we never saw it the way that it is. And we never saw, thought that this character would become so interesting. Mm. So, um, no, I wasn't, I was in London. I was just wrapping up, um, uh, wrapping up uh, Aladdin. He called me and we had a meeting. Uh, we had a FaceTime meeting. And um, we had a chat. I told him a little bit about my journey, about what I've been through. And he told me about the project and what it is. And I wasn't familiar with the show. And he said, are you, are you interested? I want to see, this is the character and that's the character that I want you to play. I said, okay, that, um, I, I love the character. It's interesting. It's very good. And uh, he said, I'm going to send you some links. Just watch the link and see what's happening. And this, char uh, this character was already casted by someone else. So they already shot seven episodes. I did not know that. So they have already shot some episodes. And then they called me. So they flew me in on Monday. No, on Sunday. I had the conversation. I think it was Thursday. On Friday, we got the confirmation. I flew out on Sunday, on Monday, I'm on the set. They hand me eight scripts and they're telling me, this is what we are doing. So what they did, an amazing cast. I mean, everybody, everybody just took me in oh, nice. beautifully and they supported me. So the character, the character was being developed and I didn't even know who the, I didn't have time to study the character, but the character was on the page and what Noah did, he took, he personalized the character. I mean, that's the first Marvel character that speaks Farsi. And um, the multiple languages that he brought in, he allowed, he took a chance on me and he allowed me to, to just be free and play with it. And he was always there. He was monitoring. He was, it was, I felt very safe. Oh, nice. Truly, I felt very safe to to fly because I knew that he always he's always there for me. We're changing the lines. It got to the point that he was writing the script. Everything was in English. Then we were talking about it, and I was reading it. I said, "Okay, you know that each of the characters, each of the languages, uh, was speaking uh, was being used for a specific reason." So when he was very militant, he was using German. When he was using, uh, when he was very mischievous, then he was speaking French. When he was very philosophic, uh, philosophical, he would speak Farsi and all the narrations and everything that was happening, it was happening in English. So we were reading the script and I was saying, oh, okay, this is how I read the script and this is how I feel. He, he's very mischievous here. We said, okay, we turn it into French. He, uh, this is very poetic. Okay, Farsi. So we went through it and it got to the point, it got, uh, it got to the point that uh, he, he understood me. I didn't even have to tell him how the character, what it is and the character that he created became such a beautiful, amazing character. That's beautiful. Uh, I had a, I had, on that show, that show, that character was one of, the, uh, one of the challenges that I had in my life. It was a big challenge, especially because I didn't know what I'm getting myself into. I literally, I didn't know. And, um, and I have to give credit to everyone, to the grip team, to the lighting, to the sound. The very first episode that I shot is when I'm on the, is when I'm on the um, fortune teller booth. Ah, uh, yep. So in the fortune teller booth, he goes, he goes all the four languages. So he goes all the different languages. And I, I, I couldn't even register the languages. I didn't know, I, I couldn't memorize. The entire crew had cue cards for me. <laughs> I, love I ran through the whole thing and I said, okay, this is my French, this is my German, this is my Farsi, and this is my English. So, Without them, I wouldn't have been able to shoot that scene. I, 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 each and every one of them, they jumped in. 
the help to, to carry me through that scene. And, um, and now the character became what it was. It was just kind of. It's brilliant to hear you talk about the team unity and the collaboration, but it's also just so powerful in that, yes, you played many roles and yes, you've created your dimensions and layers to inverted commas, these villains, but then you're getting this, this is just a game changing character. This is like a once in a lifetime. And I know you've had many once in a lifetime roles as well, but this is just such a fresh and unique look at a villain. And I've been actually obsessing over how they've done this. And yes, it's credit to everyone, but I think it's also so nice as part of your journey. When you saw the final product and it's all wrapped up, I hope that you were so proud that you could see of where you'd started to where you were then. Awesome. I, I was, I, I was, I, I was, I was like a, when I went there, I was like a lost puppy. <laughs> I, I wasn't familiar with the universe. I wasn't familiar with that world. And I went in and I had to, I, I had to study. I mean, it was so that I had all these books and comic books and everything in front of me and I'm reading about them and I'm reading about the news. I'm seeing different pictures and I'm trying to get, take everything in. But the biggest challenge on that show was the singing part. <laughs> really? Oh my gosh. If it wasn't because of Jeff Russo, I would have never been able to pull that off. We went over there and I was just struggling. I was saying, and I was scared. <laughs> I was scared that I'm embarrassing myself. And I didn't want to say, no, I'm not going to do that. I said, no, I will do it. So just help me find a way. And Jeff literally, I was in the booth. I was recording that. That poor man. <laughs> he would, he would ask me to repeat the lines, repeat the words with the different intonations. And he says, okay, I got you. That's okay. Okay, next word. Keep going. No, it has to go this way. It has to go that way. And then he paced, then he put everything together and, um, Look okay. <laughs> I didn't embarrass myself. Yeah, you did very well. <laughs> no, he did a he did a fantastic job. They uh, that team was precious. Oh, the um, the Manny Duran, uh, the head of the grid, when I was doing the center, I called him, and all the guys. All the guys from the grip department and set and set um, and set from the uh, legion, they came over, and we finished the studio in fourteen days. These guys, they came, they worked for wow. free, and Whoa. they they built everything for fourteen days, and we were done with the center. And most of the material that I have in the studio, all the flats and everything, the production when we wrapped it. They send me three trucks, all the set pieces, wood. I mean, I, oh my gosh, I think I got, what I did, I went and I pulled all the plywoods off the ground where we were building the set. I said, I need this plywood. I cannot afford it. I need the plywood. So the guys, everybody, the entire team, they helped, they took the plywoods off, they loaded it in the truck and they sent it over there to the center and that's how we, we, got, we got our wood. It was incredible. Wow, wow, okay. Very we, generous, very we, generous. We could definitely, we're gonna do a part two. We're gonna yeah. wrap up the podcast because I've taken yeah. a lot of your time. Thank um, you, thanks. We're, we're gonna do the quickest rapid fire segment in history. The first thing that springs to mind, but if you need time to think about it, it's okay. Okay, go. How is it working with Larry David? Amazing. Funny. Any moment that sticks out to you working with him? Uh, when he started laughing uh, while I was speaking and the producer says, oh, you're doing good. <laughs> what did Homeland do for your career? Um, made me a household name internationally. It just kind of it changed. I've done, you know, I, that's what it did. It completely changed my changed my life. I got me invited to the White House and oh, Shimon wow. Peres's house. So, congratulations! I thank you. It was amazing. What What inspires you? 
uh, curiosity, I think. Last time you cried? Oh, a oh, couple of days ago, I think. <laughs> it's just, I, was watching, I was watching a movie and I started crying. <laughs> oh, that's very cute. You mentioned negativity and being drained. Do you have any tools to help with that? Um, there's a, there are two sides to the coin. Flip it. Look on the other side. Um, that negativity, everything is a road sign. Is a road sign. Even the person who says no to you is because that person is not the right person for you. It means that you need to move on. Just turn, move, go. That's the best way. And the draining side of you mastering your energies? Um, I, I go back in the cave. I, uh, I, I shut everything down. I revisit all my ideas and the one that is sparks, I take it out and I go for it. Biggest pet peeve on set. The thing that annoys you the most. What, uh, 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 <laughs> there are a few, there are a few <laughs> things, there are a few things, but, um, for me it's a collaboration. And sometimes one of the problems that I have is that, um, if there's something that can be done and is right in front of you, just do it. Don't, you don't have to wait for 20 minutes for somebody to come and do it. Just, this needs to move, just move it. Let's, let's move on. It's just waste of time, waste of time, waste of money. There's lots of money and time being wasted on the set something. We spoke about Romany Road Artist Foundation. We kind of glossed over this. What is the purpose of that foundation? Um, for everybody to have a place to go. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a place built by the artists, for the artists. I've had lots of artists that they came and they helped. And um, at the same time, it's, it's a prejudice-free environment. I, I don't judge anyone. The only thing that I, is not allowed there is laziness. If you want to come and sleep on the couch, no, I'm sorry, you can't. Why do you love making antique furniture so much? Oh my gosh, have you touched antique furniture? They, the work that went in there, they were carving. I mean, I have a piece of furniture that there is no nail used, was used in this. And they were able, the way that they carved it and the way that the edges are sitting together is perfect. I mean, uh, it, people, they appreciate it. They appreciate it beauty and craftsmanship and uh, they took their time it wasn't just bam bam thank you favorite person you've worked with i know you can offend a lot of people <laughs> favorite person i've had many favorite people that i work with um but um one of the people who i really really enjoyed working with uh was mike nichols uh, he, uh, there was something about that man who, he understood me and he took me in and he became, on the set, he became kind of like my mentor. He would also teach me. And uh, I don't know, it was one of my first big movies that I did, Charlie Wilson's War. And Tom, Tom Hanks, he was a, it was, he was a sweetheart. I, Tom, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Oh my gosh, Philip was the sweetest man. I enjoyed every second with it, with him. Um, the, but Mike, Mike, it was something. It was something different. It was like, for a very first time, I, I found someone, who. I didn't have to. I didn't have to ask for permission to, to communicate with him. Oh, and he would, he would come in and he would, he would tell me about different tricks, different things. And he was talking to me about his journey and um, sweet man. It was a, I had an, I had an amazing time on that, on that set. 
just getting learning from him. Amazing. What are you most proud of? Um, what am I most proud of? I'm, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to sound arrogant, but I'm, I'm proud of not giving up. That's not arrogant at all. Yeah. But it's just, it's, uh, I've, I've had lots of people who, who they came along and they halfway, they gave up. And for me, it was not, not keeping the breach safe behind me. I had no other place to go except moving forward. And um, I just kept, I just keep going. I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm happy. I'm satisfied. Oh, beautiful. This is the last question before I ask how people can follow you and keep up to date with you. It's the one question I should have asked you. Oh, the one question I should ask. I don't know. You ask lots of questions. You ask all the questions. Um, oh my gosh. That's a very, very interesting question. And so I don't know. I don't know. The very first question. No, you covered it. I don't know. What is the first question you would have wished you've asked me? I've asked you so many questions, but I think we're going to have to do another part two just to like break down your <laughs> upbringing. But I, no. Oh, upbringing. Oh, that's going to be pain. That's going to be crazy. If there's no other question you wanted me to ask you how can people follow you keep up to date with you check out the foundation and all the things that you're doing oh uh, well uh the website for the foundation is still in the construction um uh and my website i took it off because they are also changing the whole thing um the easiest way is the is the instagram right now uh, mine is navid negapon and then romani studios is romani studios uh, when you follow it. Um, when I get a chance, I post, but, um, but whatever new happens, usually we, we put the, some of the projects that I'm doing and some of the things that I'm doing uh, because I've signed an NDA. So it's not going to be, nothing will be out there until it's out. Yeah. So, um, but uh, keep in touch, Navid Negep on, uh, on Instagram. Um, keep in touch and um, love to hear from you guys uh, let's see thank you and we'll upload that You're in welcome. the episode notes so people can check it out I've said Thanks. it all before but you are an inspiration I love your mentality Thanks. it's beautiful Thanks. and we're going to chat soon thank you so much thank you and I truly 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 enjoyed chatting with you it was fun I love Navid's quote I want to see I want to learn I want to see different things. So if I keep doing exactly the same thing again and again, the same routine, then I will become my routine and never grow. Navid has this beautiful and refreshing outlook on life where he has a glass half full approach, even when it's a so-called negative. His angle is to look at life with different lens. He explains how everything is a road sign and encourages us to think and see differently. In other words, for us to be more open-minded. By doing so, our life will change and the results will be profound. So I'll leave you with this epic quote by Anonymous. Be thankful for the closed doors, detours and roadblocks. They protect you from paths and places not meant for you. If you like this episode, share it around, tell your mates. It really helps grow the podcast and spread the positivity and love. Thank you for listening to the Funny and Failure podcast. Exploring the deeper side of comedy.